one of the very few things most adults agree on is that letting young people run the world or dictate the direction of a company or decide policy on any given topic is probably a terrible idea. Wisdom comes with age and, frankly, most young people lack wisdom. This isn't a dig at young people today. We were all young once and, if we're being honest with ourselves, the opinions we had and the decisions we made when younger make us cringe today. It's definitely true for me and I know it's true for many of you. So why would anyone ask young Catholics what direction the church should take on hot button issues is a very real question. That was the exact purpose of last October's Synod on the Undermining of the Youth, and I call it that for a reason. The proposals that come out of these synods are always very worldly. The World Youth Day that was attached to that synod was also very worldly, which I could show you if one of the rock music performers at the synod hadn't had YouTube take my video down. Seriously, that actually happened this week. Anyway, you've seen the footage of the recent World Youth Days, and you've seen the reports of how many, but certainly not all, younger Catholics want a church that's more open to the ever-changing values of the world. Yesterday, the Pope responded to the Youth Synod through the release of his papal exhortation, Christus Vivit. Like any post-conciliar document, it's long-winded and could have been cut in half and still have been too long clocking in at a whopping 299 paragraphs and over 32,000 words in length. Very few people have read the document in its full since its release, but we do know some of what is called for in Pope Francis's latest document that people will think is a magisterial teaching, unfortunately. Let's have a look. But first I wanted to thank my patrons for their support of this channel. If you want to join them in supporting my work, there are links in the description below, including links to Patreon and Subscribestar, which is actually now up and running again. Also, I wanted to repeat my call for submissions for the blog, returntotradition.org. There have been a few articles posted by viewers and supporters like you, so please feel free to submit an article for the blog if you want to use the email address in the description below. I can't pay for them at this stage of things, but I do want to help get more Catholic voices out there doing this kind of work for the Church. A Church Militant article released yesterday was one of the few that described Christos Vivit in any detail. The author of that piece, Stephen Wynn, accurately opens his article by saying that the document raises eyebrows. That article, like any others, can be found linked in the description of this video on the Sources blog, returntotradition.org. In Christus Vivit, the Pope calls for the Church to embrace change. And if you think this is just him telling people to embrace his program, think again. While he's certainly doing that, he, puts a he actually levels an attack against those of us who want the Catholic Church to return to her traditions. I'm not kidding. I have my doubts that the hand-picked kiddos who went to the Synod for the undermining of the youth were asking the Synod Fathers to uphold the timeless teachings of the Church to make the Latin Mass the default Mass on Sundays again in all parishes in the world, and for women to veil at Mass and men to dress like they're going somewhere important. No, evidently the message was for greater openness and change in the Church, because that's what the message of Christus Vivit is. Though the slight against younger Catholics who seek a return to traditional forms of the Mass and the teachings that inevitably go with it are there too. Quoting that Church Militant article, while urging youth to be protagonists of change, the Pope calls for them to ask the Lord to free the church from those who would make her grow old, encase her in the past, hold her back, or keep her at a standstill. Some are interpreting the Pope's words as a rejection of the traditional movement, with its focus on the Latin Mass, pre-Vatican II liturgy, and an active devotional life, all of which is exploding among young Catholics today. And the author of that piece is right. All of those things are exploding among young Catholics today. The number of scapulars, veils, and devotions to otherwise forgotten saints among the youth is inspiring for those of us who aren't quite so young anymore. Instead, the Pope writes, we need, quote, a church open to renewal that should not be excessively caught up in herself, but instead, and above all, reflect Jesus Christ. This means humbly acknowledging that some things concretely need to change, if that is to happen, she needs to appreciate the vision, but also the criticisms of young people." End quote. And yes, some things do need to change, including the types of men consistently seen in the Pope's presence in the Vatican. The moral leadership of the Church needs to change. 
at both the top of the hierarchy and at its lowest level, meaning the parish and in the home. Ours is a wicked generation given over to our lusts, and we know what happens historically to wicked generations. It isn't pretty, but for some reason that's not the change he's calling for almost certainly. Instead, the church must listen to what young people want of the church, and he tells us explicitly what that looks like. Here's some quotes directly from the document itself. Quote, Although many young people are happy to see a church that is humble yet confident in her gifts and capable of offering fair and fraternal criticism, others want a church that listens more, that does more than simply condemn the world. They do not want to see a church that is silent and afraid to speak, but neither one that is always battling obsessively over two or three issues. End quote. Okay, I'm not sure what church he's seeing here, but between the silence and cowardice of many prelates of the church today and the utter worldliness of most of the laity, ourselves included, I'm not sure what's being talked about here. Is he referring to those Catholics who dare to defend marriage, the family, and the lives of unborn children? Are those the two or three issues that we're obsessing over? Let's continue with the Pope's words. Quote, to be credible to young people, there are times when she needs to regain her humility and simply listen, he continues, recognizing that what others have to say can provide some light to help her better understand the gospel, end quote. Okay, so who are these others? Is this to be read in the light of the document he signed with the imam that says that God wills other religions? That's the first thing that came to mind when I read this, but it's actually probably not that. Let's let him continue in his own words. Quote, a church always on the defensive, which loses her humility and stops listening to others, which leaves no room for questions, loses her youth and turns into a museum. Even if she possesses the truth of the gospel, this does not mean that she has completely understood it. Rather, she is called to keep growing in her grasp of that inexhaustible treasure." End quote. Okay, but who are we listening to? He gives an answer when he says that the church is authoritarian in its fear of women that manifests in a failure to defend women's rights. That's interesting. What rights is he referring to? In his own words, quote, Instead, a living church can react by being attentive to the legitimate claims of those women who seek greater justice and equality. A living church can look back on history and acknowledge a fair share of male authoritarianism, domination, various forms of enslavement, abuse, and sexist violence, end quote. Be that as it may, the words here ring familiar. They remind me of the words of the militant feminists I worked with in college before I converted. All that's missing is the word patriarchy and a call for women's ordination. But don't forget, the topic of women deacons is still fresh on the minds of many in the church and still very much on the table. The Pope's call is for an open church. To quote a LifeSite article on this directly, this open church puts a personal encounter with Jesus Christ first, and any doctrinal instruction second. He insists that youth ministries must be open to all worldviews, and many of his words incline towards religious indifferentism and universal salvation. The Pope's ideas in the document have many parallels with former St. Gallen Mafia leader Cardinal Carlo Martini, now deceased, whom the Pope once called a father of the whole church. If you haven't seen the video I did on Monday about the understanding the Lavender Mafia, have a look if you can. I describe Cardinal Martini and his influence on this papacy, as well as how the Lavender Mafia have controlled the flow of information throughout the hierarchy, leaving many bishops simply unaware of things going on in their dioceses. The Pope ends his document exhorting the Church to listen to the ideas of the young, with a call for them to be agents of change. That's kind of disturbing. It sounds more like the kinds of things I saw firsthand from campus organizers trying to rally college kids to accept whatever political position was in vogue at the moment and being promoted by activist organizations. Let's hope we don't see young Catholics in the future chanting, we have nothing to lose but our chains, in front of a diocesan chancery at any time in the near future. A LifeSite article I, re I refer referenced a moment ago also quotes a young Catholic that has a good head on his shoulders. I'll quote him directly because I'd like to, you know, try to end this on a more positive note. Quote, What really matters is if I listen to the church and learn from its wisdom, Catholic college student Isaac Cross told the National Catholic Register in an October interview about the Youth Synod. The church is built upon thousands of years of tradition and doctrine, and I have especially found at college how striving to understand that doctrine of the church is a vital means of strengthening one's faith, he added. Cross related how St. John Paul II called upon the youth to 
lead the charge of evangelization, but many bishops and priests misinterpreted that idea and started to look toward the youth for guidance in forming the traditions and liturgy of the church. End quote. This young man sounds like he has a solid head on his shoulders. I do wonder if many of the students at the youth synod cited the sacred tradition of the church for guidance on how to live holy lives. I kind of doubt it. Again, many of the participants were screened by their dioceses before attending the synod. These synods are largely a show that has a predetermined outcome, one that is made clear when you understand Cardinal Martini and what he wanted for the church. If you need an example of that, look how many times the word synodality showed up at the last couple of synods, even though none of the participants invited were actually talking about that at all. I do go over that in, the, in that previous video I mentioned. In closing, it will be interesting to see what emerges from this document. It's barely been out for 24 hours at the time of the production of this video. You and I know that there are now people combing over the document, including its footnotes, to see what's hidden in it. We already know, thanks to the folks at Novus Ordo Watch, that there's not a single reference to any preconciliar papal writing. Not a single one. That should be concerning as well, but it isn't surprising. For the church that must change and consider the whims of people who aren't even members isn't one that is terribly interested in what fuddy-duddy rigid popes like Leo XIII, Pius X, or Gregory XVI had to say on much of anything. If any big items are found to have been hidden in that document, I'll go over them in the future. As always, thank you for listening and for your support. Pray and do acts of penance for the liberation and exaltation of the Church. I'm Anthony Stein. Viva Cristo Rey.